Hey everyone, it's Nurse Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video, I'm gonna go over patient positioning. So let's get started. The first position is the supine position. And notice our patient is lying on their back with the back of the head resting flat and those legs are extended. So if you're having trouble remembering this position, remember the phrase, put the patient on their spine to be supine. Now, what is this position used for? Well, it's a very popular position for sleeping. So chances are you probably slept in the supine position, or maybe you start out there, but you end up on your sides like me in the lateral position, which we're gonna talk a little bit later about. It's also used after procedures. For instance, after a lumbar puncture, sometimes this may help decrease a headache that you can get after you have that procedure. And it can be used after after heart procedures, for instance, a heart cath. You gotta keep that patient flat for several hours afterwards. You can also use this procedure for abdominal surgery. For instance, a C-section, you'll have the patient in the supine position, and it's really helpful for those head to toe assessments. Especially whenever you're assessing the anterior part of the body, you can really check a lot of different systems in this position. Now with this position, unfortunately, there are problems that can arise, especially if your patient can't move around and shift their weight. And the problem is pressure injuries, also known as pressure ulcers. So here you see our skeleton and he's in the supine position and notice everywhere there's a bony prominence there's a risk for a pressure injury the breakdown of that skin that's because that bony prominence is putting pressure on that skin and then that surface that the patient's laying on is putting pressure and we can really break down the skin's integrity so some big areas you have to watch out for as a nurse are those heels and the ankles in addition to the sacral and coccyx area, the elbow, the scapula, and the back of the head. Plus, with this position, again, if your patient can't move, they are at risk for developing a condition called foot drop. Then next, we have the prone position. And with this position, notice that our patient is lying flat on the abdomen with the leg extended. And the head can be to either side, the right or the left. Now, if you're having problems remembering this position, look at that word prone. In that word, we have the word on, and then we have the letter E. So remember that the patient is lying on their esophagus and entrails. So what is this position used for? It can be used for spinal surgery and it can be helpful for patients with certain respiratory problems such as ARDS and COVID-19. So we've always had the prone position, but it seems like over the recent years since we went through the pandemic, this position has started gaining a lot of attention because COVID patients, they have found that it's actually improved their lung status because this position proning can actually move those lung secretions. It can improve gas exchange and ease that workload on the heart. However, there are some problems with this position that you definitely have to monitor for. So if your patient is proning and they have mechanical ventilation, they have a tube in, you got to make sure you're monitoring that airway because that tube could come out or it could become blocked. Plus, we have their head turned certain ways where we're putting a lot of pressure on the ears. It could break down the ear leading it to a pressure injury. And the eyes, we got to be really careful about the eyes that we don't put too much pressure on them and damage them. Plus, up here on this area, you can develop a brachial plexus injury because those nerves can become damaged. So it's very important. We're making sure we're not putting too much pressure on that area. Next is the dorsal recumbent position. So here we have our patient lying on their back, but their knees are flexed. So if you need help remembering this position, look at the name of the position. Dorsal means a back. Think of a dolphin. They have a dorsal fin where? On their back. And recumbent means lying down. So this is a lot like that supine position, but huge difference is that we have bent knees. And look at again at that word recumbent. We have the word bent in there. So we have something bent and it's particularly the knees. This position is used for many procedures with one procedure being Foley catheter insertion on the female patient. In addition, this is a great position to provide pericarion. Now there are problems with this position and again, it deals with those bony prominences putting pressure on that skin. So 
With this, we can have breakdown on our heels, our shoulder, our elbow, the coccyx sacral area, and the back of the head. The next we have the lithotomy position. And this position is similar to the dorsal recumbent position with the patient lying on the back, but the legs are flexed at a 90 degree angle at the hips and the calf part of the legs are usually placed in stirrups. Now, why do we call it the lithotomy position? Well, let's look at lithotomy. Lith means stone and otomy deals with an incision, cutting into a body part. So we're talking about surgery. So this position is actually a position that's used during a procedure to remove stones from the urinary system. Now it's also used during vaginal procedures such as childbirth and vaginal exams, and then any type of surgery related to the genitourinary system. Now with this position, there are problems just like with the dorsal recumbent. So those pressure injuries that can happen with that position can also have with this one. Plus, whenever we have the legs in the stirrups, we have to be very careful that we're not putting pressure on those nerves in those legs. The next is the SIMS position. This is also called semi-prone. So the patient is somewhat prone, but not completely prone where they're laying on the abdomen. So here you can see our patient. The patient is lying on their left side. That is the key with the SIMS position. We're talking about being on the left side. And notice that that right hip and that knee are flexed, while that left hip and knee are slightly extended. And the arm, the right arm can be at the side and the left arm can be slightly behind the patient. Now this position can be used for Foley catheter insertion on the female patient. So if your patient wasn't able to get in that dorsal recumbent position because they have mobility issues, this is a great alternative. Plus it's a great position to give enemas in and for sleeping. Some problems that can arise from this position is that pressure injuries can occur on the ear, the great trochanter, and the side of the heel and ankle. The next is the lateral position. This is also sometimes referred to as either right or left lateral recumbent. So if you hear that term, it's also talking about this position. Now the word lateral means to the side of. So this position either deals with being on the left side or the right side. So with this position, we want to put a person in a lateral position if they are having a seizure or if they're unconscious or they've had some type of surgery where they're going to be having a lot of drainage, for instance, like throat surgery, because we want to prevent them from aspirating. So this position can help with that. In addition, it can help with keeping that airway open, which is really important on that unconscious patient and the patient who's having a seizure. In addition, it can be used during surgery of the hip and the kidneys. Problems with this position arise from pressure injuries. So because we're on our side, think of those bony prominences that hang out on our lateral side. So we have ears that could be affected, the shoulder, the elbow, the hip, the knees, the ankle, and because we have those nerves up there in the shoulder, we could damage the brachial plexus. Now let's talk about the Fowler's position. So there are about four of them, and the name of these positions comes from a surgeon. So with these positions, it's all about the angle of the head of the bed. So make sure you're paying attention to those angles because that's where you're gonna be tested at. So with this, your patient is going to be in the bed, they're gonna be lying on their back and their knees can be flexed or extended. And again, what we're paying attention to is the head of the bed, that angle. So first we have low Fowler's and with low Fowler's that head the bed is about 15 to 30 degrees. So it's almost supine, but they have a little slight elevation to it. Then we have semi Fowler's and semi Fowler's is higher than low Fowler's. Low Fowler's is the lowest of all of them. But with semi, the head of the bed is at an angle of 30 to 45 degrees. Now it's important to note that some sources will actually just group low Fowler's and semi Fowler's together and just say semi Fowler's ahead of the bed at 30, up to 30 degrees. So just keep that in mind while you're studying. Now these positions are used for sleeping, especially they're beneficial for patients who have breathing problems like heart failure because there's so much fluid backing up, putting pressure on the heart and the lung. It actually makes it easier for the patient to breathe at an angle when they're resting. It can also be beneficial during that post-op period to prevent upper body swelling if surgery was, let's say, on the neck. It helps decrease 
the swelling. And when we're talking about that 30 degree position, we want a patient at at least 30 degrees if they have increased intracranial pressure because this head of the bed elevation is going to help decrease that intracranial pressure and maintain perfusion to the brain. And then when we're talking about the 30 to 45 degree angle, it's beneficial in patients who are getting GI feedings, those enteral feedings, because it can help prevent aspiration. So, you know, sometimes there's a sign on the bed or you have these protocols that say if a patient is getting a tube feeding, their head of the bed cannot go any lower than like 30 or 45 degrees. Plus, if the patient needs suctioning, this is a good position. And if they're a critical care patient because they're at risk for aspiration and we wanna prevent ventilator associated pneumonia. And problems associated with these Fowler positions would be pressure injuries, like pressure injuries to the sacral area, the coccyx area, shoulder, spine, and heels. And then next we have the Fowler's position. And with this, it's just called Fowler's position. There's no low, semi, or high in front of it. And this is where the patient's head the bed is between 45 to 60 degrees. So they're resting on their back. Their knees could be flexed or extended. So it's a lot like low and semi Fowler's, but the head of the bed is just a little bit higher. And this position is used for many of the same things that low and semi-fowlers was used for, like eating and drinking and easing breathing with certain respiratory problems. Plus the problems associated with this position are the same as what it was for low and semi. And then lastly, we have high Fowler's position. And this is the highest position of all the Fowler's positions with that head of the bed being at about a 60 to 90 degree angle. So the patient is setting straight up in the bed as you can see here. Now with this position, it has the same usages as the other Fowler's positions, but it's very helpful for nasogastric tube insertion. And if your patient is experiencing autonomic dysreflexia. Now this only happens in patients who have a spinal cord injury at T6 or higher. And when a patient is experiencing this condition, you wanna put them up at 90 degrees because this is going to drop their blood pressure. And if you forgot what autonomic dysreflexia is, I have a whole comprehensive review that can help you review this. Now with this position, there's a risk for pressure injuries because you have your patient setting straight up in bed. So there's a lot of pressure being placed on that bottom. So there's a risk of pressure injuries to that sacral and coccyx area, the shoulders, the spine, and the heels. Now let's take a look at the Trendelenburg positions. So just like with the Fowler's position, these positions come from the last name of a surgeon. So our very first one is just Trendelenburg. And with this position, as you can see with our patient, the patient is supine but their head is lowered and their feet are elevated. And this position is useful whenever a patient is getting a central venous catheter line placement or it's getting removed like internal jugular or subclavian because it can help decrease the risk of an air embolism. In addition, it's helpful for pelvic surgeries. And in the past, it was one of those positions that you put your patient in whenever they're experiencing hypotension. But does it really help with hypotension? The jury is out on that one. Evidence is showing that possibly this Trendelenburg position doesn't help increase the blood pressure. Instead, it could actually harm cardiac function and lung function, plus it could increase the intracranial pressure. So always check with your hospital's protocols before you place a patient in the Trendelenburg position if they're having hypotension. The next is reverse Trendelenburg, and it is the opposite of Trendelenburg. So if you can understand Trendelenburg, you got reverse Trendelenburg down. This is where the patient again is supine, but the head is going to be elevated and the feet are lowered. And this position is useful for whenever patients are having surgery of their head and neck, because whenever they're in this position, it's gonna decrease blood flow and hence hopefully decrease the amount of blood loss. It's also helpful for closed cervical traction. And then lastly is modified Trendelenburg position. So with this position, you can see that our patient is flat in the supine position. Their head is level with their upper body, but their feet are elevated. So that foot of the bed angle is increased. And this position can be helpful with hemodynamic problems because it could potentially increase that venous return, which is why we're elevating those legs. So there was a case study done in 2023 that showed improvement of hemodynamic status of a patient who actually had a grade three hemorrhagic shock. Okay, so that wraps up this video and don't forget to check out the other videos in this series.